Hello everyone, today we talk about the system of balance in the second half of 15th century Italy. I think we already made a video back in the day uh, about the Treaty of Lodi in 1454 that sanctioned the new order that would remain substantially unaltered or apparently unaltered at least um, up to the Italian the, the break of the Italian wars, the, the French invasion by Charles VIII of the peninsula and all the uh, uh, subsequent uh, upheavals that would bring eventually, you know, important parts of the peninsula to be under foreign rule. And this is um, an incredibly important chapter of European history because the Italian balance was deeply intertwined with the broader continental policy, right? And the, the balance, especially with all these various regional states really was what the, all the various foreign powers bet on uh, in order to uh, simply to, to benefit from it in their own in their own realms and uh, sometimes it was something really had a, a, a fair you know very far-ranging impact right just you know it's not just really about I don't know the financial capabilities thinking about the Medici or how this impacted I don't know the French or English policy at the same time but it starts impacting from a territorial point of view, right? The same reason why this system of balance was created by the Italian states was essentially protecting the peninsula from foreign intervention, especially the French one, that as would eventually happen. This is here where we're at the end of the Hundred Years' War, right, in 1454, so the year before the, the war had ended and the Ottomans had conquered Constantinople, that especially as we will see for Venetian policy in Italy was fundamental. The Venetians uh, realized they would have had a lot of troubles in the East, so they wanted to, to freeze their, uh, you know, the, the, the Italian affairs and to maintain, especially with the, the Milanese border, certain, you know, stability. And uh, there are indeed major uh, actors, there's essentially five, as we'll see now. But there were actually many others that would be not less important. I mean, considering the, the relative importance, they, they could be crucial in shifting balance. Think about Mantua or Ferrara or these other um, important strongholds of the same Genoa, right? And all the, the, the broader Mediterranean policy at the same time still was going on. Um, but the reason of this being also that the Italians had realized how um, defenseless, in a sense, the, the individuals would be as the Italian wars would dramatically prove in a way, um, not much because they they felt the necessity of a you know of a unitary horizon, right? But quite because of the opposite of it, right? They these were mm, regional states with important capacities, right? They, these were true states. That's some most advanced political and administrative forms in late medieval Europe, but they were so you know. Um, Italy was polycentric, let's call it in this way, even if I, I made a video on, on against the concept of polycentrism, but the, the idea objectively is, yes, that these were original states emerged from s mm, over specific cities that had swallowed basically the, the others around and founded these regional states that were, however, founded specifically on the city that had no political interest to feel even itself as a part of something greater. Right, uh, Italy was a country of, let's say, of old uh, political and military uh, links, uh, the, the various leagues, think, for, since the times of the, the, the struggle against the, the Swabians, um, or, you know, even the, the Condottieri phase at this point is fundamentally up, it's usually two axes, right? It was usually Venice and Florence against Milan, and with, with important. Uh, involvement of other powers, namely also the, the, the papal states, Naples, right, and foreign powers, as we've seen here, uh, not even basically 10 years before the Aragonese had conquered Naples and had remained Angevin up to that point, so they had, all, albeit as a s sum of relatively autonomous chunks, they had Naples, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, the Balearic Islands. Uh, Aragon itself and Spain would, uh, at the end of this period, b become in fact a major player as a, not properly as a u unitary power, because still the dynastic union of Castilla and Aragon was just a sum of feudal titles, not a, a unified Spain as it would 
become just very late in time in the modern age, uh, but still the major power that eventually would uh, emerge as um, dominant in Italy and win basically the Italian wars that eventually continued mostly in the north of Europe, in Flanders and other, and other battlefields. Um, so this all, I, I presume you, you know the, the story all, but actually th this would be very interesting to discuss. This is a medieval history, manualistic mm, chapter, let's say, but the, the point is that this opens to all a phase that is crucial in early modern history, right, for, for an enormous number of reasons, not just political, but even just cultural. Think about the role of Italy or in, in, in the Renaissance, uh, or just even in, in the broader scientific, literary, you know, basically every field of European culture at this point was dominated by the Italians. And that, that's what the, the paradox is, that this country is the richest per capita, it would remain for other two centuries, that is um, in the world, actually, not even just in Europe, um, dramatically developed, mm, of very old urbanization, intensely populated, um, it is, it, and which has an enormous wealth, an enormous wealth accumulated in previous centuries, is not able to provide a common answer against these foreign threats that had the Italians been unified objectively. Just you know, thinking about the maritime dominance of Venice and Genoa, right? They hated each other guts, so they couldn't see each other, and that's the reason uh, why eventually this thing happened. And this is the history of a deep historic um, political crisis. Right, that that's something that is um, has acquired, also historiographically speaking, very deep meanings in, in the narrative of you know the passage towards modern Europe and how this eventually impacted also other countries. How uh, you know what could be the reasons of this, right? And um, the the Italian reality is often misunderstood, in my opinion, especially in the um, connection between uh, with Europe right sometimes the the idea is here that before the Italian wars the idea is was from the basically the decline of the Holy Roman Empire um, from the German imperial power that the Italians remained for like isolated for two centuries of happy isolation that, that this is something that is a fairly common historiographical uh, but you know scholars like Mallet that wrote famously about the Condottiere and so on have and other important historians, even in Italy, and 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 not just there, have underlined instead the constant connection of Italy, Italian culture, politics, etc., with the rest of Europe, and the fact that at this point the continent had become so deeply intertwined that we cannot study the things separately. We cannot um, even think that there was a, a such of a substantial a separation between Italy and other developments abroad. And this is a very fascinating topic, especially as far as warfare is concerned, because very often the same idea of uh, of the Italian failure during the the, the Italian wars um, has been seen as, oh yes, this, this basically, they, they had remained into a medieval mindset of war, right? It was just about the condottiere, it was kind of a, le you know, less bloody warfare than than the other countries, they, they weren't doing fun. Th these are all myths, right? And if you go, if you study in detail, not let alone the, you know, the political military administration. Um, I mean, the Venetian conductor were some together with the, the Burgundian army, some of the most advanced and innovative um, uh, military in Europe. They, the, the quality of these armies you know, was high for late medieval standards. Yes, they wouldn't be for early, uh, early modern ones, right? But we, we often forget that in, in this regard, um, the the gap was, was not so large, right? There are, there are certain areas of Europe that remained living in, in the Middle Ages far beyond the, 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 you know, in the modern age at some point, in terms of warfare, military organization. The idea of having a centralized state that could provide for, a, you know, this imposant number of men um, and artillery, uh, horses, and so on. Think about Switzerland in the new formula that they invented. Incidentally, actually, after the defeat they, they suffered at the end of, of the Milanese at their bed in 1422, which was actually what triggered, at that point, the rise of, the, of Swiss warfare as we know it from, from the mid-15th century, um, and that opened to, to Renaissance warfare. But we're talking also specifically of France, right? And, uh, that also was, in a way, 
we've seen it in the video on the French infantry of the hundred of, of the Italian wars um, that w was mm, let's say backward in a way considering what the, the future of warfare was considering that they couldn't have an, a, basically a, a national infantry of sort they they failed repeatedly they had to hire just a Swiss but they were dramatically advanced if we want to know all the way still with heavy cavalry that however still did its own pretty damn good job yes they lost it they easily think about Pavia think about other important battles the affirmation of the Tercio the combined arms of Pike and Shot uh, in that regard but think about artillery right in the French park but it, if you if we look at the Italian powers it was a high was a highly qualitative even just technological um, advancement that as you know it doesn't make the thing right technology doesn't by itself uh, do much, but if you think about, I don't know, the Ferrari's artillery or the uh, Mantuan cavalry, th those were, were famous all over Europe, and the, the problem of these states is that they, they had emerged fundamentally, uh, more or less, depending on, because they were also substantially different from, from each other in that way, but compared to other, um, especially to other kingdoms, Italy was not uh, a kingdom. Right, it was no thing like a national monarchy. Um, the kingdom of Italy did exist, but it was at this point emptied of concrete substance, if not for what you know the balance at this point within the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs, etc., could could mean. Right? Um, they, uh, but they they fundamentally were a bit of mercantile uh, states. Right? They were essentially oligarchies involved into banking to international trade uh, they maintain this kind of ideally republican order right even in the most tyrannic as was said at the time power such as Milan they were essentially monarchies in the way they were conceived in practice but they still maintain the formality of the idea that these states had emerged from a set of communal liberties that were defended by the Lord and uh, that still were in the name, as we were saying before, of that city, of that specific milieu, not not of a, you know, of a of a of a, of a monarchy like did the, I don't know the, the French or the English one could be. There was no such background, right? And uh, what is amazing in this regard is also how, during the 14th and the 15th century, from literally a situation that was uh, tens and tens of of different uh, city states, by the end of the 15th century we have substantially you know very well compact and you know advanced states proper right of regional scale it's provincial scale if you want depending on, in english it's a bit different depending on what you really want to mean but that individually had an enormous weight as we've seen in the international balance of of the uh, of europe uh, it's an excruciatingly complex topic especially what I care about the most readers is the European connection, but today we talk a bit more in an uh, evidential way of what the picture was at, at the, um, the the last video we made on this topic, I think the, also the only one, was specifically directed at looking at what the policy of balance actually consisted in as far as, not, not properly the formalities, but specifically why the the balance had formed itself, and also how this was shattered by um, some, you know, continuous agitation of sort, but that was was no um, uh, warfare on, on on major scale, at least not not particularly often. Or, um, however, still in this idea that, that there had to be an order, a unity to be preserved in some sort. Um, also, we do not digress on all the ideological side of the story. You know, we uh, wanted to invest more or less in the idea of an, uh, of an Italicness, of an Italianness that was, um, at this point, acquiring, uh, you know, a, a face. Uh, the idea that in the Middle Ages did, uh, th there was no thing like nationalism, but the idea that in, in the Middle Ages was no such concept like the one of nation in the in the Latin sense of the word um, is. Is actually not true. I mean, th these various countries in Europe, they, they all realized that they had something in common. They objectively spoke the same language, that the myth that these were all a set of a cluster of mm, principalities that didn't understand each other's language is, is, is actually not true, right? Especially as far as uh, Central and Northern Italy in this case are concerned, 
it was a pretty sound homogeneity since a, a very long time, right? And that's also the same way we speak properly of, a, of an Italian Renaissance and a very specific and um, at that point homogeneous because it, here we're talking about a, a dramatically um, intense interrelation between these powers, right? So um, there was no proper division in the sense as if these were isolated you know, lands and lost in the, the, the mountains or the forests of, I don't know, central, eastern. Europe. Here we're talking about the, the, literally the, 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 the most dynamic areas of, of the world, right, uh, in terms of context, of, of exchange of trade and warfare, right? If we really want to find an hybridizing factor in the history of mankind, right, the fact of fighting for centuries, one against another, means to be essentially the same thing. And the inter, um, let's say, uh, in this case, the inter-Italianity, if you want to, you can spot between, I don't know, think about the, how the sports arose, or how did the condottieri system work. I mean, these were people that traveled all over Italy, fighting here and there, and creating principalities um, in various parts of the peninsula, being, you know, always in between this broad international policy, and in, in balance, and so on. Same can be said about the other countries, right? There was properly an idea of, I don't know, Germany. Uh, or, or France. It was naturally very different, especially look at France, uh, but saying Germany, of course, it's not that there were more, but if you look at Italy specifically, that considering also the broader national issues of you, um, uh, that, mm, you know, the, the contempt rose, especially as, a, as, a, as an idea of a problem in, in contemporary history, well, we're talking about the 15th century. Look at what it was, and you'll find actually a, a much more uh, compact reality than 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 is believed, right? It, there is no equation since things were older than necessarily they were more distant, right? At some levels this can be true, but at others, and especially in relative terms with the, the rest of the world, you look at it, it may change uh, a bit your mind. Um, so this balance emerged from the attempts, right? As we've said before, there was no real intention of being a, uh, a united power, right? The, if, if you wonder whether the Italians wanted to be one, they, they couldn't care less. They all wanted to have their own power where they had built it with their own local balance. They didn't need, they, they didn't have properly the interest of investing in major, even territorial expansions, right? So the, the, the ones who did the most in this sense were the Milanese. Also, the Venetians objectively, um, in spite of their traditionally maritime policy of just seizing the ports and not caring about the interland, had taken a bit of taste, you know, by fighting against the Milanese to, to expand into northern Italy so much that they had become, uh, they had reached actually a, a few tens of kilometers from Milan, territorially speaking, and even this uh, the, the new order uh, of 1454 was fundamentally uh, about maintaining that that role um ensuring that that, that those the that, that terra firma that's how they called it that would remain uh, intact under their command um the, the local administration uh, at some point will have to i think we made a video at the point but we'll have to, to to continue doing it was was naturally very fluid right uh, the the Thinking especially at Venice, every community locally had its own space, its own autonomy. Of course, the state was, was trying to homogenize, to, to, to standardize in a way. The, the power that had made the, the greatest, uh, would accomplish the most in that regard properly as a state before the, the French invasion was Milan. Right, Milan had undergone a, 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 an intense process of homogenization. Of the, in the administration of all the various cities with sp specific officers and an effective tax system and had it gone on autonomously it, it might have uh, accomplished a lot Milan um, arrived uh, pretty close right got pretty close to to conquer literally all northern and central Italy at some point there were single battles really um, changed this that naturally it was a, an intrinsic fragility of any that, that is proper of any medieval power at this point, but let's say that, um, of course, there were many communities that would, would be formally under the, the control, especially the, 
the, the most peripheral ones would be paradoxically more eager to accept a suzerainty because they knew that that from the distance they, they couldn't be imposed too much but it still had a protection of some sort uh, Florence had emerged um, gradually I would say as a more like a commonwealth uh, ideally it was actually Florence really ruling in the surroundings um, but Tusk in spite of being the richest city in the world um, it, it had struggled to reach um, an hegemonic power over Tuscany that fundamentally was not even yet achieved um, at this point right F Florence was mostly a financial power they, they basically had possibly the worst army of, of the big ones in Italy uh, because they didn't like to invest much on um, on arms and they, they feared the idea that the middle classes the lower classes could could maybe form into a sort of, uh, of a military component could take over that they were a bit paranoid about this um, and the reason being actually that Florence was ideally the champion of republicanism um, so that their their structures of control were enhanced at this point. We made uh, a video on Cosimo de Medici, and we have seen how he basically bypassed um, that, you know, the the, the the issues of this um, fear of tyranny by instituting some private uh, the the Council of the One Hundred that was uh, fundamentally next to the arts as a um, as the new center of power. Also, the young uh, Lorenzo would fundamentally start from there as a, as a private citizen namely but the fact of being that the con the control the, the ruler of the city as a lord not much not differently at all from actually in the hell of a lordship by the way um, but the idea is that Tuscany was still fluid in a way was still breakable the the, the, first, the invasions of the, during uh, during the Italian wars would would actually prove that would see how easy it was to re make re-emerging cer certain powers in the area and there is no need much to um, to stress this but as we will see in the war for example against um, Riario and where uh, you know that would eventually you know for for Faenza and Imola that would eventually even lead to the Pazzi uh, conspiracy well that was still the idea that the, the, the traditional connections of, uh, of Florence with the with the southern Po Valley to, to, to remount is those areas between Umbria and the, the Mar uh, Romagna and so on uh, were were crucial, right? Uh, the Florence had fought also bitterly against Milan to 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 have its connections with with Central Europe with the, the merchants the, the, the goods passing via land. Um, it it was still this this is how fragile in a way such powers. Uh, were at that point. Then there was the, the papal states that were fundamentally a mess, right? But at least they had uh, actually an incredible synetic energy. They were full of warlike signories that really had they been, um, you know, put, you know, all been concentrated only towards the the, the the single effort might have had easily the the capacity to to seize actually most of Italy at that point. Uh, there were some attempts in that regard, and uh, um, in fact, uh, the, the above mentioned attempt of expansion in Romagna would be tried by by the sisters, the the, the 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 fort eventually, as we know, by the Borgia as well. Um, and it was, you know, reflecting also the in fact the, the capacity of the church that naturally was clamorously uh, powerful and rich internationally it had, you know, its own um, deal. Naples also was a pretty big. Thing, right they they had their own problems or, uh, already in, in an advanced stage to actually contend um, I mean to, to enforce a, a monarchic power proper on this, this baronial entities that sometimes were as powerful as, as as the monarchy think about the principality of Taranto or the Duchy of Calabria sometime um, so but the, it was a you know for for Blake medieval standards an imposing power as well that definitely um, was actually the most powerful if you look at this in, in terms of sheer military power but was also involved in a let's say historically but by horizons in much wider directions than just the uh, what what central and northern Italy since the communal age had been kind of a, a thing on its own right it was m more homogeneous and so on 
the south was more feudal, if you want, right? The, the cities were important, but were fundamentally under baronial control, uh, infiltration, and and the monarchy altogether f worked as a you know w without the, um, the dramatically centralized uh, systems that the the states of the north had, at least as far as they, their p power reached geographically could 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 dispose of. Um, so what we're saying before is that the, the the policy of balance emerged essentially from the need of stopping bleeding uh, stopping to bleed because th there was no much of a positive commitment for it was just the idea that for for now m more than one century these powers had been struggling against each other without accomplishing a, a big match right as we were saying before it was usually Venice and Florence against Milan this had been the case since the mid 14th century and historically the roots are, are also much older they they to the struggle between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines it was still there actually because the two uh, you know factions have been lost a bit of their original um, you know reasons of, of faith in, in the ideal but still th there was something like that I mean there was surely an intervention of the Habsburgs or at least of, of imperial power um, from one side of uh, uh, French power from uh, another and and, and, th and all those other powers that were aligned either with one or the other so there was uh, an ideal still of that sort orientatively speak there would be to, to say much about this but that that's um, uh, think about for example this uh, this Italian state had for example both quite um, quite often titles uh, recognitions, uh, feudal uh, titles, specifically offices from from the emperor, right? That legitimized uh, from in, from Germany without much of a capacity of intervention anymore. But still, these these realities in exchange of money, right? Because at this point, you know, think about the Habsburgs chronically out of, of money dramatically. Italy could afford this this purchasing of of offices of titles, and that's how fundamentally they had employed it. Still, surely in a mindset was the idea that they were in the empire, right? As far as uh, at least the what properly the Italic powers were. For example, Venice was was technically not, as you know, part of the Holy Roman Empire. Had acquired powers now, it, you know, uh, land in, properly in the Italic kingdom. It was as such, but uh, as itself, it was on its own. The papal states also technically didn't belong uh, to the Holy Roman Empire, at least in, not in the sense the emperors would, would have liked them to be. Uh, Naples didn't, right? Um, so th there were also powers that were a bit across. Think about, um, yeah, well, okay. Um, but uh, as you know, the, the strat they had mixed allegiance, right? Think about the connections of uh, Savoy with France historically, right? Doesn't matter that were Holy Roman Imperial subjects, it would actually arose importantly with an imperial policy at that point. We'll have to talk about the rise of Savoy, especially during the 15th century, which is very fascinating. Um, and th the idea is that this continuous wars had proven that th these powers together didn't have the capacity to overwhelm one another, right? Uh, they were uh, not much because they lacked resources in general, they spent an enormous deal of them. But the fact that this fragmentation would, would allow the always those who, who became too stronger to be counterbalanced immediately by others would went to the other side um, would, would freeze much of the, the situation, would, wouldn't make it uh, possible to, to reach an hegemonic power on, on the region, right? It, it, it could have been possible at some point, but still it hadn't happened. And foreign pressure, especially after the, uh, you know, as we've seen, the, the rise of France after the, under, uh, after the Hundred Years' War and the Ottoman uh, Empire in the East, made the Italians realize that they had to to wait, uh, to, to stop essentially, uh, you know, fighting against each other and rather think about the strengthening of their own states and remaining, however, with the insurance that other connationals wouldn't try something uh, dirty to try to overwhelm each other, which is what actually what they kept doing continuously, right? Here there is a diplomatic, also the development of a true modern diplomatic reality with permanent 
uh, um, um, embassies, um, this, this professional figures of, uh, of emissaries that, that would stay as a represent, uh, representatives of, of their own um, power in the various capitals and gain information, being spies, uh, politicians, and, and so on. Um, all in, with the idea that all these powers were, were backed either by by one another or um, uh, foreign powers, as we've seen. And uh, these powers had actually tried different adjustments, and they would continue doing that, uh, that. But all these designs had failed, and during the 1450s, they finally achieved a stabilization of the political picture, right? that wars and diplomatic relations between the, the, ma the major statual entities had gradually outlined, right? These powers had also emerged from, you know, from, from political reasons in, in their own specific territories that had given them, as we've seen, a, a, a sort of unity on, on their own, different in different measure, but still enough for saying, okay, well, we know that it, it, it's unlikely for, for example, a Milanese power to give up uh, its own its own identity, its own unity, its own concreteness, given what they had achieved. There were huge interests involved. The same goes for any other uh, power at that point. As we said before, there were these m more permeable areas, um, especially in the central Po Valley, in the, um, in the north of the Papal States, right, that were more... You know, they had never seen the emergence of a of a strong, you know, state. Right? They had, had remained also mm, fundamentally seigneurial powers. Mm, uh, can say more f feudal in nature, but you know, if you think about the Romanian powers, they were tendentially military aristocracies. Um, also, the center of Po Valley had seen an important coming back of the um, uh, feudal lords, um, in the intervention, the capacity of intervention in the cities. The rest were a bit more states, uh, as as we've seen. Um, and what happened in 1450s could happen also because uh, at this point had matured the conditions to put an end to to conflicts and rivalries that since decades, as we've seen, had um, uh, continued to vary the political balance and that had divided the Italian states that had you know sided every time in, in an ever more uh, different way, but not finding that, that ba the overall balance and adjustment was that they would have liked to carve for themselves. Speaking of Milan, specifically with the settlement of Francesco Sforza, the guide of the Milanese Duchy in 1450, had been solved the problem of the succession to Filippo Maria Visconti that um, had been the, the cause of very intense clashes and had seen in a different, uh, in, in a changed frame of alliances, Venice and Naples coalized against the Florentine Republic against the Duchy of Milan. This is very important because as we've seen there before historically, uh, Florence had been, you know, allied with Naples uh, and Venice right, and hostile to Milan. Now, things had shifted, right. Uh, Francesco Sforza, you know who he was, you know, he was this very important condottiere that fought, um, he emerged fundamentally in the, in the um, civil war, the uh, rise of Ioanna II, the, the, the kingdom of Naples, late Angevin period, then had passed fundamentally in the service of, of the church. He had gained this important power in, in the Romagnol, Areas and uh, the papacy had simply had to, to sanction that uh, the creation of that state. Um, the, the same Riario before we was, uh, said was fundamentally um, uh, helped by him to, to expand um, in the same areas. And uh, Sforza had wanted, uh, had always looked at the Duchy of Milan to succeed actually to Filippo Maria Visconti, that had been this the, the fundamentally the last male. Uh, the, the last ruler, right, of the Visconti dynasty that had risen to power since the, the, the second half of the 13th century in Milan and had accomplished, as we've seen, uh, a big deal in terms of Stadel, 
development in, in Lombardy, given a, a compaction in a, of a unity. Filippo Maria Visconti had specifically risen um, uh, as a rule. He was a sickly um, man. Um, he, 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 their parents had problems also because they were first cousins. Uh, had mother had a lot of abortions. That had two sons that had they, they called Marie and uh, as well in, 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 as a as a, th a thank fun fundamentally to, to the Virgin, and um, he it, it, the, the Milan had been fundamentally controlled by this important condottiere that was Facino Khan and that uh, had seized for himself within within Lombardy and the, 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 the Biscontan uh, terror dominion some important uh, signory, um, and he had died suddenly. Also, Filippo's brother, that was technically the, the heir, had had died at the same time. So basically, he found himself had found himself at the the lead of of Milan, and he married um, Facino Cane's widow. So he basically reinherited all all the uh, all the Visconti lands, and also he found this um, happy you know lucky moment of uh, conjuncture where he could re-expand importantly in the Po Valley. Um, and give a further compaction to to to, to the Visconti uh, domination. He was, you know, it's under him that the Swiss were were defeated at Arpedo. That was important because the Milanese could regain control on important mountain passes, uh, important centers like Bellinzone and so on. And that was a bit the acme of, of their power. Then things went downhill, and uh, the Sforza had been looking at it because he Filippo had just this heiress that was Bianca Visconti and um, basically a mess w was about to happen before 1444 where eventually Filippo died because the, the, well Italy had coalized uh, either pro the Sforza or pro the Visconti right there would have been a huge clash but Filippo died and in Milan there was the Ambrosian Republic rising it was a very short democratic experiment that brought eventually the Sforza to the control of the Milanese army and eventually to marry to marry Bianca. So that's how the Sforza dynasty actually installed itself in, in Milan, continuing eventually the, the Visconti legacy. So the restrengthening of Milan and uh, the also the, the situation in France sort of would, would change slowly these alliances, yet uh, with Florence, for example, um, and uh, but especially the, mo the most important factors we were saying before probably in relative terms in, in the creation of this new balance was uh, the conquest of Constantinople by the side of the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Um, the end of the Byzantine Empire caused this uh, collapse in the economical relation with the Eastern Mediterranean that had been how Venice had made the, the big money since centuries, and um, the the Ottoman expansion would, wouldn't cut that completely. Also, because the the Ottomans needed themselves to trade uh, with the West, and Venice was was basically the, the power that had com almost monopolized the world. Think, um, but naturally, it was a situation uh, the Ottomans were swarming into the Balkans. Uh, as you know, Venice had important territories also in Dalmatia. Um, there was a great upheaval going on, right? The Ottomans were crushing everybody, and um, there was, a, you know, Italy's just next to the Balkans, so um, the, the the papacy was deeply involved also in the project of, of crusade. We made important videos about that in the Balkans, think about Capistrano together with Uniadi um, at Belgrade and so on. Um, those were really moments you, you, you couldn't kid around, because the Ottomans technically had now the capacity to mount up a major expansion that, as you know, came to threaten Malta, that is basically part uh, of, of Italy. The, the Ottomans actually in the, in the 1480s landed in Apulia, right? Eventually they were, they were repelled, um, but they, they also launched s certain raids in northeastern Italy at some point. So this was very serious. Uh, situation and as you know think about it in in internet broader international terms uh, France and 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 the Ottomans would be allies right uh, in against in fact in, in later times when uh, we, we can say against Italy uh, ag as against the Habsburgs because after the defeat of France 
fundamentally between Spain and and and, and Austria, Italy had fallen into the Habsburg, um, you know, how would you want to call it, Commonwealth, where, whatever. So uh, there was a specific also, you know, picture in here that puts uh, Italy between hammer and anvil, and all these powers were pretty wary of what this could turn like. Uh, so Venice, at this point, uh, was was freaking out, right? And it, it didn't have the assets to be committed, both in the East and in, in the Po Valley, uh, say in Italy broadly meant, because also Venice, yes, had conquered, if you look at from the maps here, uh, this important northeastern part. It's important, it was the, the major territorial um, power they had. It was also the most fruitful in terms, at least, of controlled communities and so on, uh, of the world Venetian possessions. Um, and to uh, to abandon, specifically, any hegemonic um, aim in Italy itself. Because before that, they had actually thought about it, because they were rich, they had a very functional state, right? They weren't as territorialized as the Milanese, but as far as we've seen it, uh, the Milanese also had the strongest army, right, in, in, this, in that picture, in the north especially, and they, in, Venice was, was just, I mean, Venice was just a matter of how much it could in, pay in terms of, you know, hiring new troops, and then th those troops would be of the first quality, and also the ones they, they were starting to, to record on their own. This is another topic maybe we'll talk about for as far as the military organization and these um, Renaissance powers, uh, also their own militias, uh, the Provisionati, for example, these um, important... Uh, there was, yeah, they weren't concretely a mobile army, but they could provide important numbers as well. Um, and the mm, and therefore they, they said, okay, we're out of here, Right, let's freeze everything in Italy. Let's let's see if the other powers are okay with that. And and, and the other powers understood naturally, and so that's you know op as an opportunity to, you know, to, to be safer, of course, uh, to have less agitation in the peninsula, but also to maybe consolidate where Venice might have been less eager. And and as we will see, actually, the Venetians, together with the Papacy, would continue uh, attempting some some expansion, even though. The closes of, as we'll see, of the treaty of Lodi would, mm, you know, would be extremely meticulous. Like saying you can't even, you know, step into that that little castle in the frontier because otherwise everything falls. It's a bit like the Cold War, ideally, right? Even though uh, it was uh, th this idea of of peace and this uh, balance is very hypocritical in a sense, uh, because nobody cared about peace in the first place, but. The, Objectively, the, there really was um, a ratio of strength that would create a, a sort of balance. Would, but these powers, especially Florence, would have to struggle a lot uh, under Lorenzo de' Medici, especially to maintain this balance. Right? Also, because Florence was about to be swallowed by um, in uh, by by the, the papacy, by Naples, and so on. So they, there was um, a risk, concretely, that. Um, was that had to be eliminated and this passed through the maintenance of the same of the same order so this is how was reached in 1454 the treaty or the peace of Lodi whatever you want to call it which was actually mostly between Venice and Milan right as the major powers of the north uh, to which however adhered participated all the other Italian regional powers this was a meaningful political turn, right? Also because, as we've seen, were fixed and recognized the territorial boundaries between the different states, right? Between Venice and Milan, specifically the Adda River. And to grant the balance thus reached was eventually instituted an Italic League in 1455 that committed for 25 renewable years, which was, was a very long term for the political standards of the time, the five major statual realities. So, as we have seen, the Duchy of Milan, the Republics of Venice and Florence, the Papal States, and the Kingdom of Naples. Right? To maintain peace, renouncing to any 
expansionism, right? Any ideally any expansionistic project whatsoever, which that that's where the hypocrisy was at the end of the day, and to to these ends of the, you know, respecting of respecting the agreement, it was determinant, surely uh, as we remembered before, immediately right off from the start of his rise to power in 1469, of Lorenzo de Medici, right? And this figure, I think we never made a video about him. Uh, we we don't make many bibliographies, but at some point we'll have necessarily to talk about him, you know, just for manualistic terms. Um, it, it's it's difficult to begin addressing the accomplishments of this man, basically in every field, not just of government, but also of the arts, of literature, um, and diplomacy. Uh, we just remember, as we'll see better, that he uh, basically started a war with with the papacy, which also Naples uh, intervened. This happened after the Pazzi conspiracy. And the attempts where, where his brother was was assassinated, and he risked to, to be taken out. Also, he slaughtered all the plotters the very same day. That that, that is interesting in, in a double thread perspective because there is the international policy in here. The papacy essentially had uh, the, the pope had wanted that to happen, and he eventually excommunicated uh, Lorenzo in, in Florence uh, because of the of this behavior, but. Within the same Florentine uh, policy in domestic affairs, that there was also the need from the side of, of the plotters to truly really get rid of, of of the tyrant, as they were saying from a Florentine perspective, looking at Lorenzo. That, however, had managed to to maintain such an important consensus among the the, the, the Florentine oligarchy that not even the people actually participated to this rise, right? The Pazzi are a bit, you know, they're also a pathetic figure because they they believed really probably, you know, in all the hypocrisy that could exist in, in, in real politic, but really of getting rid of someone who had uh, or a family who had monopolized uh, Florentine power as a, as a private property right? There, there'd never been such a rich person like him right? Florence was not as rich as it had been in mid-14th century, but um, in terms of, of concentrated wealth in the hands of a single family, well, the Medici had accomplished what nobody had done before. The, the entire city was basically controlled. That it, Well, after the Pazzi conspiracy was a further, as you can imagine, tightening of the control um, on politics and society. But, in fact, there was a, a reason even to fight like that. And the, the people didn't rise, and, and the Pazzi failed in that sense pretty bitterly. But that's where the war broke out. And uh, as we were saying before, the Florentine army wasn't that great much. And in a desperate attempt, actually, the same Lorenzo went via ship to Naples to negotiate a truce, because Naples was the major power behind uh, the war. And he convinced, right, uh, the the king to, you know, to 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 a truce and to to maintain his order. In fact. The alliance between Florence and Naples would be reinforced also in the following years, and this saved, in a way, the same, the, the same Italian balance. Because had Florence fallen at that point, uh, even if just with a regime change, things might have gone very differently. Also in the north, in the rest of of Italy, and surely of Europe at that point. Um, so this figure with Lorenzo embodies, in many ways, the same policy of balance. Right, he died in 1492, a few months before Columbus discovered America. And that that is very um, symbolical, uh, in a way. It's the end of the Middle Ages, right, uh, and the beginning of of a new year, because uh, the Italian wars were definitely the beginning in Europe, uh, among other things, of, at least chronologically speaking, before the Reform, that was actually the most traumatic event. But that's where the thing started to be engulfed pretty badly. Well. When Lorenzo died, that uh, two years after, you know, uh, the, the French invaded, invaded the peninsula, and um, and everything changed forever in that regard. So that that's a figure that surely deserves a lot. Also, Florence, as you know, would have pretty strained times, many regime changes. Um, after that, we'll cover it on another occasion. But 
we can definitely say that that's the, the medicine policy confirm itself demonstrate itself to be the most effective instrument to the preservation of the achieved balance consider that this balance remained objectively there for 40 years albeit with some per perturbation as we'll see now but that that was a big deal for the time especially for a land that had always been fighting <laughs> since ever and it, uh, on a regular basis so um, it, it should be evaluated very carefully especially in in insight with in perspective to what would have happened later but also what was the reality the Italian reality at the time as well so what we just observe doesn't mean uh, as we already recalled that the political and military situation of Italy was characterized in the second half of the 15th century by a total uh, statistic. On the contrary, there were many, we can say secondary, but not unimportant events that were tied um, more or less um, to, to Italy broadly met, right? Not just within Italy, but as we've seen also with the connections abroad, they came to, to movement the situation. Venice was committed to contain, as we've seen, the damage uh, derived uh, coast to, to his trade and to his domination by the Turkish advance signed with the Ottomans themselves in 1454 an agreement so in the same year of the Treaty of Lodi that um, granted the continuity of traffic which surely both the Turks and, and Venice had a lot of interest in maintaining even though with a shrinking of the privilege, privileges that uh, Venice had traditionally enjoyed in the Byzantine Empire it could not be avoided because the Ottomans now had a much greater you know strength um, so that uh, for the Venetians it, it became way way more difficult to to impose their their presence in certain areas also um, the Venetian Republic managed to obtain was a sort of of blackmail right of bullying in a the government of Cyprus, right, where the, the last queen, uh, Catherine Cortner, right, it was basically um, the the heiress. Um, Cyprus had had a civil war between Lusignan's heirs, and she had emerged, and um, she had managed, at the end of the day, to also with with backing from 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 the outside of maintaining control in Cyprus. But when she decided to marry, so to give fundamentally the lordship of the island uh, to some other power the Venetians said no you give it to us and in 1489 in fact they seized control of the island however they um, that Venice had at the same time also lost an important position in 1470 um, uh, that uh, uh, an important possession that of, of great strategic relevance there was Negroponte that, it, that is Eubea fundamentally that had been taken away uh, from to them from the Turks. So, still, Venice was the among the the protagonists of the conflict that m mostly perturbed in the late 15th century the political Italian scene. Uh, and we're talking about the War of Ferrara, also known of the War of, of Salt, in these areas of the uh, you know the, the the mouth of the uh, of the Po River that were rich in, in salt and was extremely uh, extremely precious good at the time. That had already been wars, actually, uh, in the 14th century. Venice had tried to seize Ferrara and also had uh, started the war with the Della Scala for to control the salt mines. So it was uh, in the same area, in fact, it's big, the same thing. Ferrara was um, was controlled by the Este dynasty. It was an important aristocratic power that had built uh, a seigneury uh, in, in this area shel sheltered by the, you know, the, the swamps and, and where the, the populace had always supported fundamentally their rule. Um, and in fact, in this war, the Este uh, were fighting uh, against Venice together with Modena and Reggio are these other Emilian cities to in fact 
defend their own possessions from the Venetian army, but also by the Papal one, because the Papal states at this point were uh, involved in the in the attempt of widening the Romanian dominions. We're talking of Imola and Forlì specifically of Sixtus the uh, nephew Girolamo Riario, and it was the the the, the compact uh, intervention of the other members of the Italic League, uh, th uh, among which uh, Borso d'Este had during the for the rule from. 1450 to 1471 had been one of the promoters so the Este had naturally uh, as a smaller power had been a senior that had importantly asked for <laughs> maintaining the balance because they realized it could be easily wiped out it was more easily wiped out than others um, and that saved in this uh, in this situation this trend, the destiny of the Este senior right uh, limiting the damage through the concession to Venice of Rovigo and of the Polesine area with the peace of Bagnolo in 1484 right and that's where actually the salt mines were so actually Venice accomplished something but at the same time uh, they, they could have seized much more and the Italic League prevented them from doing and in spite of the permanence of the tensions within every state and the, the singular state internally, the uh, peace condition in the political uh, system defined at Lodi were maintained uh, up to the end of the century. Right? And as we've said before, to cancel the situation that had been so... Um, difficultly achieved and safeguarded was in 1494 as we have seen the invasion of Italy by the French King Charles VIII 1483-1498 who so seconded his aims, his expansionistic aims by the appeal uh, made to him in anti-Aragonese function by Ludovico il Moro Right, Ludovico Sforza, who was actually the son of Francesco Sforza and the and Bianca Visconti, and who had played, in fact, this uh, actually clever policy uh, 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 up to a point, uh, being backed by France, also by the Habsburgs at this time, that were trying also to, to ever more uh, intervene in the Italian scenario, and that, however, turned into you know this major we can't say disaster but you know major upheaval together eventually the, the Milanese the, the Sforza would lose their power Ludovico himself was captured by the French at a point as he was fleeing in Germany uh, he was captured by his own Swiss troops up to that point had been fateful um, and uh, that's another story if you want but it, it wasn't the first time that such an invitation was addressed to a French sovereign uh, to a French sovereign that, uh, for example, had been done, uh, but historically since centuries actually, but from the war of, of Fer uh, in the war of Ferrara had been done when the Venetians had demanded uh, his intervention against the the king of Naples, right? Um, the Venetians were tenentially hostile to whoever controlled Naples because, for obvious reasons, in the sense that between Apulia and the Balkans, the alternative strait passed all the Venetian ships for the east. So whoever could, the Venetians at this point actually seized control of many, would seize control of many strongholds or along the Adriatic coast of, uh, of the Napoleon kingdom, exactly to preserve especially that naval security in there. Um, this is pretty messed up things if you think about it, even just to control, right? In Venice, it's Nicky because it has the best fleet ever. So. Uh, these other powers are a bit more of terrestrial uh, nature and they're, they have, generally speaking, more financial difficulties. And um, so, but the, the the connection between Milan and France had actually been uh, always strong, right? Because the Visconti also had married into the, the French royalty. There, there had been a, the French had always looked at Milan to, to like the, 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 the next thing to seize, right? The fact that this is an historical... Uh, recurrence. Think about you know very 
a, a unified France tendentially always wants to conquer Italy. That that's how it, it happens. Think about um, not recent times, but let's say um, I, I was I was going as you know as far as the the, the Carolingians, but that's actually a real thing there, um, and. Um, the the Hundred Years' War had prevented France to uh, France has these phases historically to, to, to where wherever it's prevented to be unified whether it's the war against the Angevins England um, the 12th century or uh, the, the the Hundred Years' War eventually the wars of religion in the 16th, 16th century um, the 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 Fronde in, in the 17th uh, it, it it's naturally its capability of intervention abroad ceases but wherever it's reunified then france starts invading the, all the rest like you look at napoleon uh, the wars of french revolution th because of the enormous power that this unified land has demogra especially in pre-industrial times as uh, demo terms of demographic agricultural resources right and the french were uh, Eventually, with Francis the First uh, during the Italian Wars, was, was obsessed with Italy and Italian culture. He had all this library made, according to humanist theses. Uh, they they saw uh, a, a, a French monarch would see Italy just as an extension of France, right? Something they had to seize immediately, and Milan was the not just the closest uh, landmass to, to to you know politically speaking the power land power to to France, but. Um, also, as we've seen, the most robust state from which eventually France could expand further, right? And that's what they they try to do. Essentially, as you know, France, uh, excuse me, Milan would would be ruled by the French for a while, and um, they that was all. But most of what the wars of Italy would would would, would be about. Um, that point, I'll bite. They naturally, uh, because of the Angevin connection that now had been. A, Wiped out in Naples by the Aragonese, they they won. They claimed the suzerainty of uh, on the Napoleon throne, right? So there were many reasons for that. Charles VIII also was a quite of a character. He he truly believed, uh, even here in the broader hypocrisy, that you know he had to conquer Naples, reconquer Naples, so that he could eventually launch a crusade against the Turks. Uh, the, there is still here. Here it's difficult to to be tra trace the parameters of what an international priority would be, but by, by the the late 15th century, here we're we're in a phase of a transition between a, we could if there is any such a thing between a medieval and a Renaissance thought, right? Um, s um, states would become more powerful, there were more responsibilities, more more necessities in a way, um, as well. Um, but the the point here uh, we conclude with is the fragility of the political balance of the Italian peninsula, right? Net uh, de facto brought to the beginning of a new phase in the history of Europe itself. From from that moment, the Italian regional states would have had to measure with the uh, way more solid um, European national monarchies, uh, becoming unavoidably an object of conquest. Uh, uh, and um, as we said at the very beginning, even this picture is not to be given so for, for granted. There is a reason that for which eventually things turned the way they did, but even in there, there is nothing deterministic in it, right? It was an extremely delicate political picture. The same Italy would maintain actually largely an, an important autonomy. These were lands that were not could not be ruled, for example, with iron fist, right? Um, that there was always um, uh, that they were too rich, they were too populated. That they, the, the as as you know, also under the Habsburgs, the, the Italian uh, aristocracy was, would be co-opted at so many levels of policy of the, the, of, the of the military, um, of diplomacy. Uh, of financial power, financial power. Think about the the Genoese, uh, the the Bank of Saint George that rose as the major, you know, funding um, agent of the Spanish crown after the failure of the Fuggers, right? So um, there is um, there is a necessity of maintaining a balance once again, right? Speaking of balance, right? If you we can't jump from the the balance of the Italian regional states to, to the balance of the Habsburg Empire that was a much actually much more difficult thing um, to achieve in perspective and th this is to say it's not a few really in comparison and 
but the the point here the the real explanation we could give is really in, as always in the political and social forms of the Italian regional states as we were saying before these were not states that could develop easily a unity of any sort right they their um pop populations were involved also in different activities from the ones of other countries there was no interest from the side of the population, but not from the side of the elites, especially to form, for example, a professional military class to count in the thousands, like, I don't know, the Swiss were creating. Um, they they weren't together as many that as to, to maintain, really, even just demographically speaking. The, the Italians were were many, but they, in proportion to, to the rest of Europe, they hadn't been many as before. It's just they were very concentrated, but especially devastating the rich. So... The question is even just why did the condottieri rose? Because evidently there was no need for these people to go fight for I don't know struggling for their own independence like the Swiss had, had done, right? Their elites could simply fit into these new uh, empires with this kind of soft, permeable, autonomous uh, reality that could allow them even I don't know if they were technically under Habsburgic domination to flirt with with France or to to, to simply have also their own specific military or political military policy. There were powers like, I don't know, Venice um, or Savoy or, or, or Florence or the Papal States that technically didn't didn't end in the hands of, uh, of anyone. They, they remained uh, autonomous, uh, tendentially pro-Habsburg, pro but for, for reasons that were properly, you know, for, for interests that they had deliberately. Right. If you look at the Italian wars, you say, "What? Well, why did I don't know? These guys lost a, a chance or or two, or even more to knock out the foreign power at that point because they didn't care for that por foreign power were there. Because if your lordship was actually benefiting from it, the better it was. Right? You didn't care f f uh, about the neighbor because there was no sense of unity, no political interest to reason like that. And they did w fairly well. I mean, the, the word naturally mistakes is that." as in any of these situations but even if you look at them more closely r you realize that the situation even think about the French I mean think about the French defeat in the end uh, even in there you can't say you know that there was a a teleal I don't know a deterministic reason for which this had to happen right or for which they, they played badly or they weren't fit for it or there were some ar there was some arcane reason for which the, these powers couldn't make it um, or I don't know the the apps works that the best paint did better. Uh, it it could vary. It could change. Sometimes it's really the the matter of a single man that could make the difference. Think of I don't know uh, Gonzalo de Cordova, right? Uh, the Grand Capitan. No, nobody actually mentions him more than much, uh, but he was with no doubt and by far the, the greatest commander in, in in modern history. Nobody cares, right? But if you think about Without him, just like a battle like Cerignola that sanctions truly the rise, the affirmation of pike and shot warfare uh, against the French cavalry, what that was a hell of a thing. It took those people. It could, it, of course, it took their background. It could, their, it, it took their own context, right? But it, everything can be explained through uh, through these paths. But at the same time, these paths tell you how precarious the possibility that this could happen before could be. So never take history like for granted. Never take history as it had to happen like that. Because most of the times it didn't. And nor it did even after it happened. Right? You could say, oh, you know, maybe free will doesn't does not exist. Yes, but still our capacity to to calculate that that doesn't exist either. Uh, it's uh, certain things happen even without we, we don't realize. Right, idealism and realism do not quite work well. Um, either ways, right? Yeah, unless you you accept that they exist both, they interfere, they interplay. Uh, we could say more technically because this is one of those topics that deserves to be dealt with with adequate care, studying the specific uh, scenarios. Like I think the most fascinating way to that this is just a broader sketch of saying, okay, look. This is what happened, like in the in the second half of fifteenth century Italy, but it's exactly this reality as 
as of course others did, but this one that had a uh, that that in a way exalts the the particularism, right? We were quoting Guicciardini some some video before this, and he saw while Machiavelli saw in the moral decadence of civic uh, values and all this stuff the the cause of this collapse. Um, the Guicciardini looked looked in a more disenchanted way also said well look these states were also very different right and and, and within those differences lay mapping in some of the most important things you, you you can actually grasp from this reality so at some point as we will finish especially these manuals we will get to something more local in terms of uh, which is also big in its own like it, the, these were as we were saying specifically states there were not you know scattered uh, even the smaller scenarios had an important power right and uh, they have to be analyzed quite closely I hope we will be doing it soon at some point um, for now let's just stop the let's just finish the various um, you know the, the, this various basic historical introductions that last from three years right so you can imagine what the the eventual um, uh, you know in in-depth uh, looks can 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 take uh, this history never ends right and, and it can't be otherwise but I just hope for now that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye